night trips, Koala here. How many of you have seen this before? A tank rolls up to a firing position, acquires its target, fires its big ol' 120mm gun, and then raises the gun barrel right up to salute their opponent as it goes up in flames. A gracious victor. Well, it's a nice thought, but as you might have suspected, it's not why tanks do this. Welcome back to the Armorcast channel, lads and lasses, where in today's quick episode of Koala Explains, we're going over the famous tank salute, and the reason for it, as well as when it's needed, and when it isn't. So I've gotten dozens of questions about this topic in previous videos, despite it being a very simple question with a very simple explanation. And just like in the M1 Abrams combat ID panels which we covered in the first episode, there are a lot of people answering this question with the wrong answer. The most common suggestion I've seen is that tanks do this to expel gases from the barrel after firing, which does seem to make sense. But this isn't anything to do with the real reason, which is actually far simpler. Tank interiors are incredibly cramped spaces, and their ammunition is heavy for a human loader to keep lifting up from the ammunition storage and into the breech of the gun, weighing in the neighbourhood of 50 pounds or almost 25 kilograms. Because of this, what many tanks do when loading, the most famous example being the Leopard 2, is that they'll depress the gun breech inside of the turret, which has the obvious effect of raising the barrel of the gun as it pivots at the mantlet, in order to make loading rounds into the breech easier and quicker, and less tiring for the loader. No matter how much military training you've been through, you're not going to be loading the 18th 50 pound shell up and into the breech, quite as fast as you did the second or third particularly if you have to haul it up above chest height in such a cramped space. Though the difference this does make to load times is usually quite small, maybe 1-2 to two seconds per shell, in a combat environment where a loader may have to lug 50 pound shells up and into the breach 25 times, as well as having been in that cramped space for multiple hours, the effects of fatigue on the loader and the crew in general can become a real issue for the tank's effectiveness in that environment. So any way to help offset that is well worth looking at. In the case of the Leopard 2, the loader has to reach over the breach from the side in order to access the ammunition stored in the rear of the turret and load the next round something he may not even be physically able to do with the gun at a firing position, thanks to the small vertical dimensions of the Leopard 2's turret. When we take a look at Challenger 2, for example, another tank which does this, the loader has to retrieve a bag charge from the hull for each new round, meaning they have to bring that ammunition up above head height in order to load it. As such, shortening the distance the loader has to move the rounds and giving them more space to slot them into the breach can make a lot of difference. You won't generally, however, see an M1 Abrams doing this, as an Abrams loader sits much higher up compared to the breach and much further back behind it. That allows them to easily retrieve rounds from the rear of the turret and pass them straight into the gun, without having to lift them up or flip them over the breach in such a cramped space. But Koala, wouldn't he raising the gun after every shot throw the gunner wildly off his target? Well, in tanks where this system exists, the gunner's sight is automatically decoupled from the gun stabilisation and elevation mechanism after firing allowing the gun to move up and down freely while the sight remains on target. Thus to the gunner, nothing is actually happening. Once a new round is loaded into the gun, and the breech block which seals the chamber is closed and locked, the loader hits a button to automatically realign the gun with the sight, and the gunner is free to fire, with their sight having never left the target. It's also worth remembering that if you're firing on the move, the gun has to be locked into place after firing anyway, to prevent the breech from moving up and down as the tank drives over bumps in the terrain and the stabilisation system compensates, keeping the gun on target. This is also often visible even in stationary tanks, by watching how the gun moves as the tank rocks back due to recoil. Instead of remaining stabilised, the gun moves with the tank, making loading far easier and less hazardous. Now I know what you're all likely saying by this point, what about autoloaders? The discussion of autoloaders versus human loaders goes around and around, we'll talk about it in its own video sometime, but it is true that an autoloading tank doesn't need to worry about ergonomic dimensions of the turret, or systems to help the loader to reload, right? In actual fact, it changes nothing, as the gun still has to be locked into place at a specific height for the mechanism to be able to feed rounds into the breech, just as it does in a manually loaded tank. In these cases, however, rather than move the gun barrel up in order to depress the breech for the loader, the gun is moved back down to an exactly level position with the tank and locked in place to align with the autoloader. 
So while the Leopard 2 raises its gun barrel to salute its opponents after blowing them to pieces, auto-loading tanks like the K2 Black Panther bow to their enemies instead. Or perhaps this is them hanging their heads in shame. Tanks may also raise their guns as a safety precaution when moving through rough terrain so that the gun doesn't hit the dirt if the tank drops down into a ditch. And this is commonly seen on firing ranges as well, as it signifies to evaluators which tanks are engaging and which ones aren't. The last time you'll see it is during parades, once again for safety, although perhaps the saluting anecdote does come into play here too. Either way, it looks damn cool. That's it for this video lads, I hope you've enjoyed hearing about this topic and perhaps learned a little something you hadn't heard before. Before I go, I do want to shout out our Patreon. Videos like this featuring military footage can often cost money to produce, licensing footage to use, while they like to cause YouTube's not safe for advertiser bots to short circuit. I mean... So support from you lads and lasses on Patreon is really important, which is why all our backers get access to special rewards. For just $1, you'll get access to our exclusive Discord server, where you can hang out with us and chat about military tech, gaming, etc. For $3, you'll get your name featured in video credits, while for $5, you can get early access to all our videos ad-free. There are more tiers and rewards for backers, so definitely make sure to go check it out at the link below. I really, really appreciate your support. Thank you all for watching, stay safe, and I'll catch you lads on the battlefield. Now we move on to my favourite part, and that is the aircraft, where there are a whole buttload of new models, variants, and potential new mechanics and weapon systems. So I'm going to have to just pick my favourite ones here to talk about, or the ones I think you guys will want to hear about the most, or we will be here all day. By the way, there will be a link to the full list of leaked vehicles and some more images too, so go check them out if you want to look at some of the things I'm skipping over here, that'll be down below. 